In this video, I'm going over part two of learning terminal. In it, I go over 11 essential commands you need to know to get around terminal easily. So before I jump into these 11 commands, I just want to preface this video just to say this is a skim of these commands. I'm not doing deep dives into each command because I don't really like spending 30 minutes to 45 minutes uh, doing deep dives and explaining every single option in a command. I would like you to refer back to part one where I say man and then the command and also the command dash dash help. These kind of expand out so you can learn more about these commands. I'm just showing basic usage just to let you know these commands exist. This is how many people get around terminal quickly and efficiently. So with that said, let's jump into the actual commands. Okay, so now let's get into the actual learning the more advanced commands that just kind of help you get around in console a little bit better here. Uh, these commands are very, very vital. I use them daily, if not every hour almost. So let's go ahead and jump in here and do history for our first command. So if you just type history into your terminal, you kind of see everything I've done lately you can kind of see hey i was uploading a file to my website i was doing all these other things and let's say i wanted to execute one of these commands let's say i want to do hey my my bash shell i'm going to change some things in my bash cell so if you the next command i'm going to teach after history is how to execute history so uh one thing that's really awesome here is if you hit the exclamation mark and then type uh let's say in a in if you look up to line 134 here you see it says nano dot bash rec and you don't actually have to do history before this you could just type the exclamation mark and then ser is a lot of ones i use a lot where i'm rebooting services or system control or these types of things that's what you use this for so you don't have to type all that out so as you see it went ahead and executed that nano command from history so that's pretty awesome and um that's very, very powerful. Another thing you can do is actually execute certain line numbers of history. So let's say you wanted to do 134. You see how that works too? So you can do that as well. And uh, that's pretty nice if you have this up and you just go, hey, I don't even want to type the very beginning numbers. It's easier to type this. So you can kind of see all the different things I've done as far as like, hey, I was doing some firewall rules here and I could easily pull that in as well. So that's just those two commands history and then exclamation mark last command and i'm going to put this in the description down below just so you know so uh the next up is an echo command so if you type echo blah you see how it echoes the blah well that doesn't really do much for you however uh when it comes to system variables let's say you forgot what your wine prefix is you could use that or Let's see what the wine architecture is. It's currently not set. Or you could do echo shell, see what the shell is. Oh, I'm not using bash, so it's bin bash. If it's ZH, ZSH, it would be bin ZSH. Um, you can do echo editor. Let's see what editor I'm using. I don't have that one set, but I could set like nano instead of vim or whatever as a default. There's all these other system and tools are basically the echo command can actually call those system environment and if you're unsure of something you can actually just type that in here we're using the echo command and see what that variable is so very very powerful tool okay let's talk about system control or system ctl real fast system ctl is basically a service that uh, controls what runs when your system starts up. So you have many options after system CTL. You have enabled to enable a service, status to check the status of it, start and stop to, you know, and then also enable and disable. And this enable and disable mainly just says, hey, I want this to always start when I start my computer or I want to disable it so it doesn't start. Um, and that's the main commands you need to know. And I'll have this in the description as well. And you can also look it up through the manual by typing uh, man system CTL. But for today, let's just check starting off what services are currently on the system, not necessarily enabled. So we do this by just a system CTL list unit files. 
This pulls up a nice long list with a whole bunch of stuff. Anything that says static or disabled, just leave alone. Enabled and disabled are the ones that you can toggle back and, for back and forth. So these are uh, really, really uh, good things to know. But when you're looking at this, it's just there's just so much stuff that comes with it that's not necessarily running. So I need to teach you the next command, uh, or the grep command as it's called, and we'll, we need to kind of cull this down. So to do this, let's do this, but we do the pipe symbol. That's above the inner key again. And then we do grep and then say enabled. And what this does is it says, hey, I know you're about to spit out a whole bunch of stuff, but I only want to grep or grip the enabled stuff. And then as you see, it really culls that down. So now we've got a really good list of what is being done on this system. So that grep command is super powerful. You can use it with any command and it is just a lifesaver, especially when you just get a wall of text like we just saw. So that's system CTL and grep uh, just in a quick breeze through. Again, if you guys need a deeper dive in these certain commands, I highly recommend doing man, system CTL. I talked about this in the last video, but it kind of gives you a really good synopsis of what everything looks like, when to use it, and gives you a good readout. So if you really want a further understanding and not just the quick overview that I'm doing today, this is a good way to get that. So with that done, we can move on to our next command, uh, which will be disk free well disk free is pretty darn awesome and something i do every single day anytime i wonder how much hard disk device i have uh df kind of spits out what we have here now sometimes it spits out a bunch of garbage here puts it in bytes and things you can't read you can do df space dash h just think of human human readable df space dash h gives you that nice human readable touch so from here, you'll be able to see that uh, the drive usage and see, hey, uh, the home directory right now, I'm using almost all of my 230 gig solid state. So that's something I should keep in the back of my head that I need to look, watch out for. Everything else is looking good. I'm not even touching how much uh, I need to do on any of them. So I'm, I'm good there as far as storage is concerned. But again, that's just DF and then dash H. I almost always use the DAF8, dash H command with it. Uh, I, the other one usually sometimes gives some garbage and stuff. So just remember DF dash H. Uh, with that done, I wanted to go and touch on SSH. And SSH is basically <laughs> learning or basically running remote commands or remote terminal on another box. This is extremely vital in business. I use it every day. I, my entire website, I can't even remember the last time I didn't SSH into it to do all those things. So to SSH locally though, uh, most, most devices don't run on what's called keys. I'm not going to get in that today just because it can be a very, very long winded uh, subject. If you're going outside into the world and trying to SSH in a box, almost always you're going to need what's called a certification key or a SSH key that is generated with encryption. Uh, these I'm not going over today just because uh, that is, again, a very long tutorial. But let's say you have a Raspberry Pi that I wanted to SSH into. So I happen to have one that I use for a variety of different things. So let's SSH into my Raspberry Pi. Um, Pi is the standard user. And then uh, I put the at symbol. So SSH space, the username, at, and then whatever address it resides on. You can also use host names here as well. I always use IP addresses just because I'm a nerd like that. And then I'll say, hey, we haven't SSH'd into this before. Can you verify the fingerprint? I always just say yes. And then it'll say, hey, type in the password. And then from here, we can kind of see, hey, what, what's going on with this RetroPie? Actually, I set it up as RetroPie, of course. And then uh, you can kind of see all the other stuff I have. I got Cody and some other things on there that I just use. Um, kind of as a test box for my, my Raspberry Pi. But to get out of the Raspberry Pi, you can run all your terminal commands here and you're like, okay, I'm done with this box, I need to get out. You just simply exit. 
and this closes the connection and now we're back into our system notice how the username before the prompt actually changed to the raspberry pi which its host name was retro pi and then it when i hit exit it moved this back over into our system and that's ssh i'm not going to go too much into that i could probably spend a good 20 minutes on ssh alone i just wanted to show this just so you don't have to think that you need to download some other program like in windows you're using putty or some other program you're downloading on the web and it's all built baked into the nice terminal in linux and it is just completely awesome okay so the next command i wanted to show you is one just basic checking what ip address you have so if you're in Ubuntu, it's an IF config, and this would actually pull in your, your actual IP addresses. This uses, I believe, the IP tools deal. Um, however, if you're in an RPM-based distro like Fedora and CentOS, or if you're in a Manjaro or Arch-based, it's just IP space A or ADDR. It doesn't matter, we'll just do A for short. This kind of shows you, hey, I have two network cards, uh, LO is just a loopback, which is just default. So just go ahead and leave that alone. Um, but you can also see what other it is. So you can actually check what your actual IP address is right here. It's the 192.168.69.90. That is my local IP. But let's say I actually wanted to check what my external IP is. Now there's a long command you can actually, I have to Google every time. Um, it's a dig command and to memorize it takes a lot of work. <laughs> However, uh, there's a cheat way of doing it and getting your external IP and that's just to curl it. So if we do a curl if config dot me, it'll say, um, oops, <laughs> if config dot me. It'll say, hey, that was 76.85. You know, I'm not going to say all that because saying my external IP to you guys is probably not a good idea. But you get the you get the gist of it. If you just do that simple curl command, you'll go ahead and be able to see your external IP right there and be able to do all the stuff that you want to do, which is awesome. So uh, that is the IP ADDR or IF config, depending on the distro you're on to check your IP address. And then also just curling your external IP um, to just curl IF config.me. That was the easiest one for me to personally remember. There are other ones you could get that from, but that's the one I like to use and been using for many years on my personal computers. Um, and that is that in a nutshell as far as anything you need to know about learning your IP address. So the next couple things I kind of wanted to show for an advanced thing is one, just seeing what processes are running. By default, top is installed in every distribution. And if you top, you can kind of see what your CPU usage is and then kind of browse around and see what uh, processes you're using. Now, obviously, since I'm in very high font here, I can't really see much, just my top running processes. So I'm gonna go ahead and quit out of this um, just by doing a Q. Now, I do recommend something called HTOP. HTOP is a lot more powerful and allows scrollability. So you see it kind of condenses all the CPU and I can kind of just guide around with my arrow keys. And let's say I find a process that I don't want, I could easily just say, hey, I'm, I'm tired of broadcasting using OBS and just hit, you know, F9 and kill that process. And then when I'm done, I can hit F10 to quit. But there's a lot of things that you can use this for. And HTOP is just mandatory, in my opinion, as I do a lot of stuff. And when you get stuck in terminal, HTOP is just a lifesaver. So this is how you do it. Uh, obviously, you wouldn't use HTOP that much in... Um, a desktop environment you would do like a control escape and just pull up your regular uh, command to kill processes in the GUI using graphic user interface but in terminal HTOP is king so I hope you liked this video uh, these 11 commands I use almost on a daily basis I love doing them and honestly my research into this video was me just hitting history and looking at the glass couple you know 50 commands i've typed in i'm like all right cool i'm gonna go and make a video about those commands because that's obviously what i'm using the most so that's how i came up with these commands in this video um one thing i noticed when i rewatched uh my how to here 
was that I missed the grip command a little bit. I wanted to expand on that. Piping and gripping in pretty much a lot of commands. One thing I should have mentioned was when you do a cat and then a file name, you can also do the pipe symbol and then the grip command and then any specific search text you want and it'll just spit out that line on like a text file, which is really uh, powerful as well. And then also curling or the curl command. Uh, you need to install curl to use that for IF config, but curl is pretty much needed in a ton of applications so highly recommend installing that package to use curl if config dot me uh, i love curl but a lot of system uh security specialists do not like curl because a lot of times people are running full scripts using curl and then like an external address and it will pull all that in so uh, with all that said guys uh, that's it for today's video and i'll see you in the next one